nobody would say, like disagree. The gospel is that Jesus, for example, died for right. sinners. Everybody says that. But the question is, what what does that mean? You know, I don't care who it is. We're all capable of sinning terribly. Yeah. We're all care. We have sinned terribly. Yeah. Like so, it's not like we've accumulated and amassed a debt nobody can pay. But the human heart and human mind is twisted. Is. Yeah. The person who has a sensitive conscience, meaning anybody who's awake spiritually at all, and not deceived, will realize their constant need for forgiveness and their constant need for God's patience and grace and compassion. Yeah. When you re- believe the gospel by true faith, and you believe the promises of God, you are justified by faith right then and there forever. You don't ever fall out of that state, that declaration, that legal status that you have. It's done. Okay, we are coming back after a break with uh, Adam Kalustian, pastor of Ventura Reformed Church. If you did, if you missed the last episode, we wrestled through what it means to be reformed, and um, maybe we made it more muddy than ever. But uh, hopefully, it's <laughs> helpful to someone. <laughs> maybe yeah, you did. Just, yeah, I, don't, I doubt it. Yeah, I muddied it. Yeah, I don't know about cleaned it up, but yeah, we could work on that. <laughs> no, it's good. Good to have you. Have you back, Adam? Adam Thanks. Adam's at Ventura Reformed and does. Uh, as a church plant in the Ventura Oxnard area. So any watchers you need to you need to go over to Ventura Reformed and um, it's a wonderful church and it's a great effort, new plant, and uh, they're doing well. So we're thankful to have you on the program. Yeah, good to be here. Thank yeah. you. Well, last time we wrestled what it means to be reformed. And um, this time we're going to get a little more specific and um, talk about the gospel. Yeah. Like what is the gospel? And today for some reason, I mean, it's always been a struggle in the history of the church because, well, the gospel takes everything from us and gives us everything in Christ, but it's a hard thing um, for people to, I think, accept the claims of the gospel sometimes. I mean, it's called a stumbling block, right? Christ is stone, mm. stumbling rock and offense. But when it comes to Reformed theology, when it comes to what we believe, obviously, one of the great truths of our faith is what we believe about the Christian gospel, yeah. right? And gospel itself, meaning good news, right? Yeah. Um, let's start with that. Um, why has there been so much confusion? And maybe maybe let's aim this a little bit at those who listen, who because we're kind of, especially since you're doing church planning, we're trying to think about those who maybe the, the these, you would think gospel would be familiar, but those who this concept's even new to. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. that's important. So. Okay, uh, basic Christian way of understanding life. Yeah. God exists. He's the creator of everything. You know, anything that exists <laughs> besides God is created by God. Right. And God reliably communicates through what we call today the Christian Bible. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I guess if you're starting from scratch, you have to talk about why. Christians believe those two things, you know, that God is okay, but let's, you know, and by the way, if you visit our churches and you have questions about that, we like to talk to people about that. So please come and whatever. But anyway, um, one of the clearest teachings in the Bible is that humanity has rebelled against God and incurred his wrath, his terrible anger uh, for our rebellion, uh, for which we must and will give an account Right. And uh, so the idea of the gospel or the good news is that uh, God provided a rescue by his grace, meaning the opposite of what we deserved. He provided a rescue from our perilous condition of being in the brokenness of this world, which is part of his judgment. You know, just uh, so Christians don't believe that like death and misery and disasters are like natural in the way it should be. It's just part of life, shrug your shoulders. No, it's an expression of God's, uh, broadly speaking, his wrath against a, a rebellious world. And not only in this life, but in the life to come, right? So, I mean, people, I think, generally have a sense that when we talk about the gospel, we're talking about how God rescues people from their perilous spiritual and I would say physical condition, you know? Um, and And so we'll get into that that teaching in a minute. I mean, I, I, to me, it's more interesting in a way 
um, also to talk to people in churches about the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, I'm turning 50 in December and I think about like, um, you know, we were saying like the broader evangelical churches, you know, today, when I was younger, I think a lot of those churches and movements came out of and were started by people who had grown up in more historic Protestant churches who knew more of the Bible and who knew more what the gospel taught. But as time went on, so like th- those people had good biblical training mm-hmm. in the gospel and these kind of things more clear. But in broader evangelicalism itself, like that, these, these historic teachings are not really understood or taught clearly, if they're even believed. And uh, so I think people are, you know, they, they maybe agree with everything I just said about what the gospel is, but it doesn't go any further than that. But here's the, here's the thing, like, no Christian church or group of churches for, again, 2,000 years. So if you listen to the last program, we said, okay, Orthodox churches, Roman Catholicism, historic Protestants, or broader evangelicals today of all different kinds. Nobody would say, like, disagree. The gospel is that Jesus, for example, died for right. sinners. Everybody says that. But the question mm-hmm. is, what, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Like, now, this, this might be terrifying to some people but to think about, but, like, whatever church you're a part of, do you know what that church means? Like, if I just asked you personally, based on what you've been taught, what does it mean that Jesus died for your sins? I mean, there have been countless answers to that question yeah. in church history. Right, right. And depending on where you go to church and what the pastor or leaders teach, uh, even if they're aware exactly of where they are on that question or not self-consciously, but whatever sort of they teach and whatever you've read, like where you are on that issue, this is important. So like when we talk about the gospel, we don't want to just leave it at those basic things. Although those basic things are very important to say them clearly and tell people why we even get to that point. But I, I think the reason why, you know, you're bringing it up is because we want to be very clear about how God has rescued right. desperate people through Jesus Christ. Obviously, it's an urgent question it's to urgent, us. It's yeah. an urgent question, especially because, well, Satan has done everything he can to wreck this message, muddle it up, confuse it, um, so that you know, we lose the heart of why we are even in Christian ministry. Like, what what is the heart of what we do? What is the heart of what we're aiming for in ministry? What is the heart of you, Adam, at Ventura Reform? What's the heart, uh, aim of my ministry here in Escondido? Well, you know, Paul said so clearly, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Yeah. Like, he's calling down prophetic curses. It's, it's Isaiah style there. Like, you know, when Isaiah says, woe is me, I'm undone. Paul's taking that and saying, woe is me if I don't preach this. So he has something very specific in mind. And it's not saying, as some people have said, well, this is all we talk about. This is all we do. It's the heart and center and core of our message. This is what God has sent out pastors to do. Um, How beautiful are the feet of those who are sent to proclaim glad tidings of peace. Mm -hmm. Like, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. Like, of all things God could have done, right? You know, we're in this this mess. We're we're sinful. We are full of rebellion. I don't know how anyone can look around in society, even if they don't believe the claims of Christianity and not see something's gone terribly wrong. We're dying. Yeah. There's there's misery all around us. Yeah. Oh, by the way, inside of us. Inside of us. Look in the mirror. Yeah, Yeah. Everybody, oh, modern, oh, I'm so this, that. You know what? Yeah, look in yourself. Just take yourself down off a pedestal. Yeah, right. You know, so obviously, uh, you know, obviously the 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 common way to we're encouraged to look at ourselves is who am let me look inside, let me see who I am and let me give um affirmation and expression to that and demand it from everybody else. Yeah. And I'm not just pointing out at the word. I'm saying I'm the same yeah. way too by yeah. nature. I want to just say I'm fine. Yeah. You're not fine. You're not fine. Nobody's fine. Nobody's I'm fine. not fine and you're not. And it's tired of everybody just thinks Sin they're the powerful. next way to oh, us. It's disgusting. Like yeah. how everybody thinks they're and oh, they're... and 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 what we're capable of doing. Like yeah. you know, I don't care who it is. We're all capable of sinning terribly. Yeah. We're all care we have sinned terribly. Yeah. Like so, it's not like We've accumulated and amassed a debt nobody can pay, but the human heart and human mind is twisted. Yeah. 
it's and broken. I, right. And the beauty is that, like what you're saying, so the church is given, yeah, and, and the ministry is given to through the proclamation of that gospel of what God has done to reconcile. We are seeing people reconciled to God, no longer right. his antagonism uh, so he could toward have, us that we had rebelled against. Let him. me back up for a second. He yeah. could have. Oh, yeah. He could have announced wrath and judgment from the beginning and ended it. Yeah. He could have ended this. Yeah, when, like, we, when we sided with the devil. Yeah. You know, so the why garden, do we been... think we're still here? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, why are yeah, we existing? Yeah, yeah. It's because he is actually, from the beginning, right after the fall into sin and our rebellion, he actually announced good news. Yeah. He actually announced a coming Savior. That's right out of Genesis. Yeah. And the whole Bible is showing this unfolding of this plan. This of this amazing God who desires mercy and not judgment. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, he's like announcing this to the ends of the earth for and, and not just for one nation, yeah. by the way, for all peoples, all ethnicities. He's announcing this to the ends of the earth that listen, come be reconciled. Yeah. I, I will forgive your sins. You can be justified by faith and have peace with me. That's the heart of what we're trying to accomplish here. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Well, wow, beautiful. Yeah. Like, the, the the message that we get to bring, but not as appreciated as it should be. I think, um, I think because well, there's what isn't of, appreciated as much? What I'm saying not is not just the gospel. What do you mean? What I'm saying is, is that today we're we're pulled away in so many different ways from what's most important for us, and I think this affects how people view ministry, what they think ministry is about. We've come to this time where, and I'm not, I'm not wanting to get into this rabbit hole at all, trout trail, but you know, we we now think politics is the big issue of the day. Mm. We now think, you know, temporal problems. Um, yeah. Everybody already believes that gospel, Chris. At yeah. least the good people, the good the good half believes the gospel. The bad right. half is hopeless. And let's just talk about, you know, as the good half. Let's move beyond the gospel and talk about the things that really matter, like yeah. politics, like, do we know, like do, winning the culture back, yeah. like, yeah, Which you're making sure our you're kids trying are to happy. Do with Ventura. <laughs> making sure our kids are happy. To go, yeah. But, oh, by the way, so let me bring that up because I've been wanting to do that, right? So I was just <laughs> laughing in uh, discussions you've been having uh, about um, optimistic amillennialism. <laughs> I, I just want to say, and I don't know who I represent other than myself, to say that I am a proud bearer of the most pessimistic, uh, I am the most pessimistic amillennial person ever. I just want to say that and I wear it with pride. I, you know, every, that when I read the New Testament, the, the perspective is at the one time, like ironically, Christ is, is obviously reigning and he's building his church and he's rescuing people and he's optimistic. remaking them at his base. Well, that's optimistic, but everything else going to complete crap. And I, I have no problem with that at all. I love it. When in I fact, spoke of, yeah. when I spoke of optimism yeah. in that discussion, yeah. what I was saying was be of good cheer. The world's overcome. Yeah. Uh, Christ has won the victory. All right. Well, I just he don't is... want anybody to think that I'm trying to win Ventura or <laughs> I'm going to reclaim this, redeem the city of Ventura Knox. for Jesus. And Knox, all the, no, right? I, no, I don't want to have anything Ventura to do with that. Give me Ventura or I'll no, die. No, no, no. Give me the people of Ventura to come to the church. <laughs> I want a lot of them to come, but I also read the New Testament and I know that, you know, probably not, you know. So anyways, whatever. Okay. I'm just well, that was the most I'm a pessimist. Enjoyable. So I'm, I'm just admonishing you. Like you yeah. could let people be pessimistic, amillennial people. Yeah, I just think I, I want I want people to know like the victory certain. Yeah, yeah, you know? in Christ. Yeah, certain. yeah. So, but but my my perspective is yeah, I'm optimistic in the new heavens and the new earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm just talking about. I think the difference between then and now is going to be pretty, you know, significant. Like that, the purging is going to be pretty pretty deep and hot. Sure. Like the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's I mean we're in the thick of it. Yeah. So anyway, um, okay, but this, this, this gets to the this gets to the issue. Like the reason I am optimistic is because in AD thirty uh, month of Nisan, six hour of the day, <laughs> the God Man said it's finished. I mean, it's a, it's a, w what a message. Yeah, like God would send His Son, His eternal Son, to come down here, assume a human nature. And take on, live a righteous life, and take on himself. I was just preaching Matthew 8 last week. I was struck that after Jesus heals three times, or after the Sermon on the Mount, which seems kind of combative at times and hard, going after the religion of the Pharisees, he does three healings, and then it says this was done to fulfill Isaiah 53. Hmm. He bore our illnesses. Yeah, yeah. Like, wh whoa. Yeah. He didn't, like, you just talked about the hardship. He didn't. You know, I try to find words to help people. I try to find words to lift people up. 
He carried them. Yeah. He bore them right. all the way to the cross so that we're assured of a resurrection. Like the, the, the gospel's running through everything. This good news of the work of the Son of God for you. And the whole Bible's trying to tell us that. So what I'm saying is that when we're sort of off it is that um, this is God's power to deliver people this core message. And we have to stay front and center on this great message to help people. Yeah. And you preach all the beautiful aspects of it mm-hmm. from different places in the scripture right? and all the benefits of it, right? As opposed to an idea where you just say, Jesus died on the cross for sinners, yeah. accept him into your heart and whatever. This is the problem that I have, okay? Yeah, yeah. So part of it is because I, I grew up in it. Although, again, in a context that was because of my age, in a context that was more biblical, um, but, you know, generally speaking, like, it's just assumed that people know what that means. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and accept him into your heart. First of all, what, what does that even mean? Not, not only Jesus uh, uh, died on the cross for your sins, but what does it mean that uh, you're supposed to accept him into your heart? Right. This kind of language. Uh, what, what is communicated by having, uh, you know, a massive meeting where people are compelled mm-hmm. with... Uh, or obviously orchestrated emotional, you mm-hmm. know, things to make some religious decision that we know doesn't have like the staying power or whatever. It's a, you know, it's a, uh, it's a produced thing. Like I, I, I just, uh, what, what I find very unhelpful in, in the even short, but medium and long-term answer to my conscience and to people's consciences is really some watered down uh, and, and unclear gospel. Yeah. What, what, what are we talking about? Right, so, right. you, you know, you, you're introducing the idea of Jesus suffering his whole life mm-hmm. and especially on the cross, right. you know, to, um, to take the judgment that otherwise is outstanding mm-hmm. against me in my place and to, to preach that from all of the scriptures mm-hmm. for that to be the main, because that is the main message of the scripture. It's, it's prophesied and foreshadowed in so many beautiful right. ways throughout right. the old Testament. Right. Jesus life and teachings. And then of course he's fulfilled like in the actual stories of what he did. And like you just quoted uh, from Matthew. And, and I think like that, ha- that has to be the heart and center of the ministry. I mean, the same for no other reason too, that, you know, the, the sensitive, the person who has a sensitive conscience, meaning anybody who's awake spiritually at all and not deceived will realize their constant need for forgiveness. And their constant need for God's patience and grace and compassion. And so they need to hear this over and over and over right, again in back, its full beauty. Let's yeah. come back to what you said, though, um, about gospel presentation. I think you're right that, well, there's kind of a reformed version of that, too, we can talk about. But um, a little sort of preaching that preaches the law heavy and then at the end says, don't worry, Jesus did it all for you. Just yeah, kind check. of this cheap yeah. way of preaching yeah, Jesus. Yeah. But but I think you're right. Oh, I got another one, by the way, if we're... If we're taking shots at ourselves. Uh, you know, there's the other one too, where it's like, where getting clear and outlining the, uh, the proper theological angles and jargon, right? Like, uh, is what the impression you get is that that is what my, my intellectual achievement Mm -hmm. of that doctrine of that system of doctrine Mm -hmm is what saves me. Yeah, right. I right? passed so a th- test. Yeah, yeah, I, I, right. So I now I have the secret insight into mm-hmm. predestination and therefore God loves yeah. and accepts me. No, yeah. I've run into that too. And, no, and that's, a, that's a big deal. Yeah. That's a big deal. And that's deal. a huge problem. Yeah. Like, and that was one of the things that, I mean, well, Wilson brought up uh, along the way about the doctrinal test. Sometimes we're just doing the doctrinal test. And Sproul came along and said, no, we don't believe that you're justified just by getting something right. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, exactly. It's like, exactly. But it's not what we're yeah. saying. Just um, in Christ. Yeah. We're just saying, what does that mean to be in Christ? Yeah. Right. And, and obviously people are at different levels, true Christians are at different mm-hmm. levels of understanding as far as right. that goes. But anyway, we're just trying to dig in a little bit more. I mean, with those caveats, right? Yeah. We, we, so but we, the we, one you're talking about is important because I think a majority of people still been accustomed to this, that this gospel is this, this, the gospel itself is my acceptance. Oh yeah. You yeah. Know, yeah. The yeah. Gospel I did. Yeah. The gospel itself is that I made this momentary decision and therefore, and, and I'm, I'm good now. Thanks. I'm good now. Yeah. Thanks. Like that, that's, that's been a common presentation of the gospel in America. And you know, I, I remember one time, Adam, I was preaching at a church 
and they were doing the um uh, the Billy Graham last crusade of Billy Graham hmm. was happening down here in San Diego. And that Sunday I was preaching at a visiting church and I was preaching on the rich young ruler. Well, I didn't know that was happening. So they had a, the big crusade video oh. up before I went up to preach. And then I said, I preach Jesus breaking every evangelistic <laughs> method <laughs> yeah, that's of right. the day. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Send you know, them away. Send yeah. them away, sorrowful. <laughs> yeah, like, you right. just failed, yeah, right? You, yeah. you didn't. And and the point is, is there was no real... I mean, if that man had followed the sort of common approach that we are so used to, Jesus would have said, Jesus would have said, you know, hey, great. Come on in. Just just accept me. Sign yeah. on the dotted line. You're yeah. good. Yeah. No, Jesus pressed him with the claims and the diagnosis of sin and pressed him with the law of God so as to search him and to try him, and it found him failing. And he didn't understand even who Jesus was. Sure. He didn't even know really who was standing in front of him, and he wasn't w- willing to turn away from, from sin and look to Christ. So the point is, is like, when we're talking about the gospel, we're talking about the power of God to set us free. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's our work in any way that sets us free. Even the faith we have is a gift. Right. I think that's important. But that it's, it's God's means when he announces this good news that we receive by faith. It was a work done outside of us. We have everything necessary to deliver us from all of our sins and justify us right then and there. Absolutely. Yeah, the two, the two sides of it. The one side, we already expressed the idea that Jesus suffered his whole life, you know, from the moment of his conception, uh, and especially on the cross, and absolutely, objectively took our judgment fully away. So he was condemned in our place so that we will not be condemned when we stand in the judgment. So he took our sin on himself. The other side of the coin is the second thing is that he was always perfectly obedient in his thoughts, Mm -hmm. in everything he said, and certainly all of his priorities and the decisions and the, that he made and the actions that he took, they were all obedient and earning God's rewards, meriting God's rewards. And that perfect obedience that he worked for us is credited to us, given to us. It's like a robe that the father puts on us as if we did it ourselves so that we stand in judgment. Not only we don't have any thing outstanding against us because Christ was already judged in our place for us, but we are treated as beautifully obedient and worthy of all of this new heavens and the new earth of, mm-hmm. of the glorification, the resurrection, but everything great uh, that we could have never earned ourselves. Yeah, right. All of that mm-hmm. done for us. And the spirit opens our heart to see our desperate need for those things. Cry out to Christ and receive him by faith. And, and we're safe. Like, that's amazing, it's right? Amazing. This is gospel. This is, uh, yeah, so look, like what I, maybe we'll talk more like in detail, but it, it's not necessarily all that complicated right. to differentiate what we just said as the basic gospel with that and the other corruptions of it in church history. Mm-hmm. So, you know, again, if you have orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism, you know, our argument is going to be that although different systems of different kinds in those groups, um, the basic issue is that moral and religious works, so moral works just meaning everyday life decisions about what you do and what you don't do, and religious works, you know, self-explanatory, things you do in the church or whatever, moral and religious works do not contribute to your standing before yeah. God as clean. Yeah, and and, this and is, this, this, this so, really I important. mean, we can go down into like, yeah. All different applications of that uh, as you're opening the scriptures and as we could talk about in church history, how this played out, this controversy played out. But this is the difference. So this is this is one of the two or three major differences mm-hmm. between an historic Protestant church, the Lutheran, the Reformed, including the, you know, the Reformed, including the Presbyterians, the Reformed, and the, you know, High Anglicans, whatever you want to say. But historic Protestants believe this gospel that we're talking about. The other groups don't agree with what we just said, mm-hmm. by the way. And the broader evangelicalism, we started getting into it, which is like harder to nail down because mm-hmm. some of them, even like in their statement of faith, might allude to some of these ideas, but they just not mm-hmm. entirely. By, by the way, this is what we were talking about before. Yeah. This is why I think it's helpful. This is a huge issue. Like, how did Jesus rescue people? Yeah, it's a huge issue. Right I now, mean, now, like, so it's not okay to like dumb down, like this, churches have been talking about this for mm-hmm. 2,000 years. Yeah. Broader evangelicalism, generally speaking, wants to say, well, we kind of side with the Protestants on this issue, but we don't want to get like 
They, they don't want to articulate it in the fullness of it as it was by the historic Protestant communions. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, and, 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 it, and it leaves people wide open to yeah. believing other false views, by the way. Yeah. And this is the problem with broader evangelicals, so let alone what you said about the revival system. Am I saved by, look, Chris, I'm sorry. I would, when I was a boy, I, look, I, I'm very thankful for my Christian upbringing, but I was like a youth group kid, loved my youth leaders. They loved me. God used them, all that. Okay. And maybe it was just me, but here's something that I was always wondering. What, what do I really have to do to be a Christian? <laughs> like, I, I know I'm supposed to be. Right, right. And I know that guy up there or that girl up there, that lo they love me. Like they're, and they love, seem like they love God and love the Bible. And I believe they did. Like, but I basically thought to be a Christian, like, I have to have the zeal that they have. Like, okay. I never would. This is good. I, this if is I could good. be a yep. zealous person for God. Mm -hmm. Then I'm Christian. And not just zealous, right? It was presented as if you get your life cleaned up. Yeah. At, to a certain level. To a certain level. No habitual sins. Yeah. Like, I could have some sins, but not habitual ones. So right there, I was toast. Yeah. Well, you know what it does to you? It, it makes you either a horrible legalist, meaning like you ignore all these things that you obviously are problems with you. But you do a few good things, like you're active in church, you're you're whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and like you know a lot about the Bible. That was my thing. Oh, I, compared to my peers, oh, I knew a lot about the Bible. Good on me. But you know, for me at that time, what it was, as I look back, I, you know, probably subconsciously, it was like I would, I my conscience bothered me. Right. I didn't really have an answer, so I poured myself into Bible study or pour myself into church life or certain things. But what I'm saying is it creates a legalism mm -hmm. where I'm saying like, I'm ignoring the real issues is there's no answer to my conscience about whatever it might be, my pride, my lust, my yeah. laziness, whatever it might be. And, and, and so you try to try to look at the things that you can do and, and, and say like, that makes up for the stuff that I don't really have an answer for. Like that's, mm -hmm. what's going on. Right. Or the other thing it does is people just leave Christianity yeah. because they're like, look, I can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Right. I can't. Yeah. No, this so, is good. So because, like, you know, you don't preach this this beautiful gospel. What are you leaving people yeah, with? Yeah, so you're if you're giving the insinuation that, number one, listen, the gospel is for people who substantially enough get their lives together to receive it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, you've, all, you've already wrecked it. Great. Like, like um, think think about this. You know, Paul, Paul goes through in Romans, this is the book to look at. Um, he, he goes through brutal chapters in the first few chapters of just, you know, the throat's an open tomb, the poison of lisp, uh, ass was on their lips. Yeah. They, I mean, it's just blow after blow after blow. Okay. Then you get to Romans three, but now, right, the righteousness of God is revealed apart from the law. What that means is apart from any of your doing. Apart from any of your efforts, righteousness is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. They all testified of it, right? Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there's no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here, here it is. <laughs> being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth. It goes on to say, this is a free gift. Like, this is a free gift of his grace. Mm -hmm. So so God provides this righteousness. God supplies this righteousness. He gives us the faith to receive it. And the message is, there is not one work that we do. We are simply recipients and onlookers of the grace that has been accomplished for us in Christ. None. And, and that's where people struggle. Yeah. Like, it can't be that good. And he goes on to make the whole case with Abraham. But with Abraham, he says something interesting that I just, I've never been able to get over. And David, is he uses two examples. Yeah. We know the stories. But in the middle of it, he says, and God who justifies the wicked. Yeah, that's amazing. The wicked. Yeah. Like, that's the word. Right. Wicked. That's the Abraham was wicked. Yeah. Abraham, uh, David was wicked, and God freely justified yeah. him. And then David says, that's why I wrote Psalm 32, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute sin. That's right. I mean, that is the best news ever. 
But it's so good, I think people get nervous because you're gonna you're gonna create antinomians. Yeah, that's what they think. Or when really, yeah. really the, the gospel is the only power to free me from the guilt and shame that I have. And it's also the thing that recreates me, you know, to begin to to do good works and want to do them. Right. Um yeah, I mean, I just think it's a it's a twisted like fallen human psychology that that the gospel now is is foreign to it. Like it just yeah. we're averse to it because but it's lapsing always into self righteousness, mm -hmm. you know. But I mean, this is why. But again, um, historically, you know, reading these passages in Romans that you've just alluded to, and and letting them speak clearly is what the Protestant Reformation is all about what is a reformed church or why would I visit a reformed church? Because like of two or three issues, this is, you know, one, one a about like the difference between <laughs> what yeah. became to be called the historic Protestant church and the other churches. Like we believe this moral or religious works do not contribute to your standing before God right. period. Right. So, you know, all you say, what about the, well, the, the, this is what the reformation was about. Yeah. And, and period. Just, yeah. And it's like, you can't just, not talk about these uh, discussions in church history and broader evangelicalism and, and make the issue go away um, because uh, explicitly or, or implicitly you leave people with the idea that there's something that they can do to, to get themselves reconciled to God. And you either create a, a moralist legalist person or you create somebody who is in despair because they can never live up to these standards. That's and right. so, you know, That's this right. is why we're reformed. This is why, I mean, we joked, but when I made profession of faith in Escondido, like, you know, but everybody's story is different. How did they come into a reformed church if, if they didn't grow up in it? Right. Well, mine was like through Calvinism. Yeah. I had a friend who was, um, you know, who introduced me to predestination and I thought he was completely insane and in a cult and all this, who could ever believe in this idea of God predestination, the idea that God, uh, graciously chooses, uh, to, to save certain amount of people, you know, mm -hmm. through Christ, through his justifying work. Anyways, my my entrance into the church, uh, into reformed churches was through the the teaching of predestination. But for me, like it, I as I remember it, it what happened was it it really humbled me out of the legalism. Mm -hmm. It was like oh, now at first I was terrified for a while because what it taught me was no God's judgment is like just I think. And whereas before I pretty thought I must was been good enough, like God would accept me for us. But this made me realize, wait a minute. Um, the only way for anybody, like God's grace is so powerful because the sin is so powerful. Well, that made me see first was my sin. And, and it was for a while I was like, okay, I believe this predestination, but how do I know I'm saved? When I learned justification and the gospel promise that all who cry out to him for mercy for what Jesus has done, he will receive. Like, that's where the relief came. Um, but my point was just to say that, like, I had been around gospel teaching a long time, mm -hmm. or generic gospel teaching, but it wasn't until I started hearing more about the discussions in church history about what that meant that I feel like the Spirit, I mean, at a minimum, really grew me uh, humbled me like in a, in in good ways and also gave me true joy and like i i for the first time or at least in in, a, in such a great measure right so this is why we're working in the reformed churches it's to 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 bring this love of christ mm -hmm. and this this gospel to people freedom. that need it yeah the freedom and i yeah. think and jesus said the truth will set you free I, i'm always amazed that paul in romans really hones in on the moment abraham was justified like eight, Genesis 15, six was it. Yeah, he believed. Like, yeah. He believed God. So God comes, gives a promise. Look at the stars. Look at the sand. So shall your descendants be. And the next verse is, so Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And Paul says right there, yeah. right there. At that night, Abraham was forever justified. And this is important because you do have people who confuse this today. You have people speaking even to this day of multiple justifications based on your works at the last day. I mean, there's all these kind of things being said. Paul won't have it, you know, and even what happened later in, in, um, 
that James picks up in chapter two. He's talking about Abraham proving his faith, demonstrating his faith. But that night when Abraham believed the God, and this is is important for people to hear. When you believe the gospel by true faith and you believe the promises of God, you are justified by faith right then and there forever. You don't ever fall out of that state, that declaration, that legal status that you have. It's done. Yeah. Like you're justified. Whatever happens from that point is a life of struggle and sanctification, but that does not annul justification. That's right. True faith receives Christ and all of his benefits. Heidelberg 60 is beautiful on this, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So you're right, but people, people need to, you know, they need to understand this, but they need to appreciate because we're always being pulled away from it. Like it's, it's the whole struggle in the history of the church to hold on to this great truth. There's a reason you have the book of Galatians. The yeah. whole church abandoned it. Sure. So this is it's a big issue in the New Testament. And the reason why it matters, Adam, is because Paul sets two principles all throughout Romans that, listen, it's either all of grace or it's all of works. There's no middle ground here. Right. It's not like it's this mixture of how people kind of commonly think that if my good will outweigh the bad. That's how, that's not a de facto position. Christ, Christ fills in the cracks yeah. where you messed up a little bit. It's yeah. a de facto position of your average unbelieving neighbor. Like mm-hmm. if you say, how are you going to go to heaven? You do the evangelism explosion thing, which I know you do all the time. Yeah, so. that's, that's, that's my method <laughs> you know, right there. Yeah. But, but anyways, <laughs> uh, if you ask that question, you know, you're going to get the sort of default answer, right? I, I, my, I'm, I'm a good person. I, so, so, um, but then you go through, well, have you ever stolen your, whatever. You, you're not in this middle position here. It's either all of your works or all of grace. Paul sees no middle ground. So if you're going to try to stand on your works, you got to do them all. You got to be perfect. Yeah. If not, it's all of grace, which is why we say grace, because it's all of Christ who's given to you for you yeah. in your place as a substitutionary atonement. Right. That's, that's, it's the best message God could ever give us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what a God, as I coming back to earlier, what a God who could have judged us instead announced this to us and sends out preachers everywhere to preach this message that sets people free. Yeah. Uh, my concern is that uh, it... it um, you know, if it's if it's understood and believed this way, it gets papered over uh, through other you know meeting other people's needs, right? This is the primary uh, engine yeah. of the modern right. um, ministry model, modern church. I you know so I see this a lot, uh, you know, in my upbringing in Southern California and still to through to today. Like I think I mentioned it before, you know, we there's a a pattern for ministry where it's like meeting people's needs where they add in programs for it which I think can be good. But again, if it's not prior to that, if the gospel ministry is not established in a place and ministered in that context, then all we're doing is being like a social service organization, right. Right. Um, which has its, uh, which has its place, but it's not the Christian church. Um, if that's all it is. Right. So mm-hmm. uh, this is, kind of the other, the concern that I see. I mean, so I, you know, summarize my thing is I, I, you know, are people clear about this gospel? Mm -hmm. Uh, Is it being, are the preachers clear about this gospel? The church leadership clear about this gospel? Is it explicitly taught, proclaimed? Is it the center of the ministry? Um, You know, these are the answer to a lot of these questions is simply no, you know, and uh, I, you know, I, I, my son said to me the other day, so he's starting at um, high school and, and he's in town at a public school. And he, you know, he has a, his group of Christian friends and, and contacts and Christian teachers there that are, you know, kind of a support network. Um, but yeah, some of his friends, you know, he mentions, yeah, like they, they're, they're critical of say like Roman Catholicism or whatever he says, but, but I'm not sure they know why. Yeah. You know, they, they know like in their opinion, Catholic is bad or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah, well, they know why, like, did, do they know the good things about it? Mm-hmm. Uh, did they know what the Protestant Reformation was fundamentally about? And, and, you know, as someone was telling me, yeah, I don't, I don't think that we, you know, not that he's some expert on it either or whatever, but he just noticed that um, he was mentioning how he notices we try to be more aware of who we are, what we have in common with the other Christian Mm -hmm. groups 
what dis- d- differences we have and why they're important, you know. And I just think this is something that has been, you know, lost on a lot of people. Yeah. And again, this yeah. is just the religious part of our population, right? Mm-hmm. The Christian part of our population. We haven't even talked about the, yeah. you know, the non-church, yeah. unchurch, yeah. de-church so, people. Yeah. So there's two, just for a minute back to the Christian portion of the population, because I think some people here, and they say, well, you know, Lloyd-Jones said years ago, if you preach the gospel right, you'll be called an antinomian. Um, there's, there's sort of been a, a, a modern surge of attack against overemphasis on this as if it's just a justification gospel message only. I, I, um, I think we're talking about priority here. Okay. Like, we're talking about priority as the central aim of the Christian ministry, which is to preach the gospel. I do think Godfrey years ago wrote a helpful arg- article for Ligonier where he talked about the use of gospel as different in different contexts in scripture. So sometimes gospels used very narrowly. 1 Corinthians 15. This is the gospel that I delivered to you. Jesus, you know, in many form of the apostles creed there, you know, he died, he rose again. Um the, the, the gospel was the objective work of Christ, narrowly focused on him alone. Right. Godfrey then goes on to speak, in some contexts, the gospel includes not just justification, but sanctification. Yeah. So you have to look at how gospel's being used, but it is good news to say that it, it, it's, it's not right just to say, when we look at certain passages, gospel's only justification, and gospel has no implication for sanctification. Yeah. Right? So we want to make clear it, that... We do believe in telling people how to live. There's a lot of attention given that to Scripture, and it's good news that the Spirit's sanctifying us. That's good news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, right, we could be accused of being reductionistic, right? Right. All all you talk about is the record of a debt outstanding against God and that it's Mm -hmm. credited, you know, goes on Christ, he pays it, and his righteousness credit to you, and you call it. And so you don't talk about, like, the resurrection from the dead. You don't talk about it. No, okay. Or the uh, the new life that we have in Christ. So, okay, but here's, but first of all, that's not, uh, well, it it could be true, mm-hmm. and if it is true, then shame on us. We shouldn't be reductionistic. <laughs> like, right. Fine, right. but but theologically, it's not true. Right. Like so, for example, one of the, the again Reformed Church Heidelberg Catechism, right? So you first thing in our new members class, or what I talk to people when I read the Catechism is learn the three G's, the three parts: guilt, grace, gratitude. Right. If you're going to be in a Dutch Reformed Church, you have to know the three G's or the three S's: sin, salvation, service. The three main sections of the Catechism, because brilliant theological simple but brilliant how if you're talking about the christian faith you have to have uh uh the the free gospel of grace mm-hmm. and you have to have obedience otherwise we're talking about a different religion mm-hmm. but we we separate them out as systematic categories yes. in the catechism yes. right because we don't want our good works to Right. Spill over into our understanding of how we stand before God right. in the judgment. That's really so, important. Yeah, but but now the catechism articulates at different places the relationship between the saving, gracious work of God in Jesus Christ right. and how it recreates us, makes us alive, um, not only motivates us to do good works, but empowers us by the Spirit to begin to do them. Like so so this this relationship is described and and our new life that we do receive is part of overall speaking our rescue right exactly but the the when we're talking about the debates in church history we're trying to figure out where that line is and and the protestants right. are saying right. you know between works and grace grace right. and works and we're saying there's there's a hard line and the hard line is that nothing that we do contributes to our standing uh before god in the judgment now, he always, in those that he grants faith and rescues by his grace, he always gives his spirit and makes them alive mm-hmm. such that they begin to do good works. Right. So there's no such thing as a person who's a uh, carnal Christian, just a carnal Christian, just like yeah. is the same person that they are before. It's amazing because in our, in our catechism, for example, we're giving expression to what we think the Bible is saying. We, we say that, look, we're still inclined toward all evils. We, we have to admit that like in this life. We're still inclined toward all evils. Right. But at the same time, there's another truth that's also true of us being saved, is that we all, we all have begun to desire now good things mm-hmm. and what's true. And now there's a, there's a war in us that wasn't 
right. a fight before. It's really you important. Know. Yeah. yeah. But I'm just trying to say, but like, and all you're that bringing it as this part, broadly speaking, gospel. Right. You want to talk about the effects of the gospel. Right. Or broadly speaking, the rescue. And you're I, talking about the Spirit's work. Yeah. Spirit's work to sanctify, which is, you know, yes, there's obviously, we, you know, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it's him who works. But um, I, I think you're right. We, what we want to say so clearly is, listen, justification by grace through faith alone. Yeah. <laughs> like that alone is really important. Yeah. Right. He justifies. He he's, quits us before the tribunal of God. We are acquitted forever. Um, but that's not confused with sanctification, as has been done. But there is a connection. So it's not not confused. The connection is, like you're saying, when I'm justified— I begin a new life of obedience. Mm -hmm. Like that's important. Like that's just what um, our Heidelberg says. You know, I, I love our Heidelberg because it's realistic about sin. Like even in the Christian life, yeah. like, you know, even the holiest in this life make a small beginning of this new obedience, which I always say, yeah. well, what about the least holy? Yeah. Like yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, but, that's uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's but right. it is an interesting question, yeah. right? If even the holiest make a small beginning, what about the least holy? Yeah. The you least know? Guy. But um, then it goes on to say, realistically, nevertheless, we do begin. We begin to live according to all, not just some, but all of God's commands. Right. Yeah. Like, th so it's, it's a Romans 7 struggle um, that's going to go on. But that doesn't alter or change because you're in the struggle or fail or even get knocked back or stumble or have a backsliding sin. It doesn't take away or somehow remove the status you have been given as acquitted before God. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've a simple thing, but um, when Jesus teaches his people to pray, teaches us to pray as part of our regular prayer, forgive us our debts, like, what does that assume? <laughs> that assumes that Christians will still uh, sin. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> so exactly. here's, here's your regular prayer yeah. as a superhero Christian, guys, disciples, yeah, teach us to us pray. Here you day. go. Forgive us our debts, right? Yeah. So it's, but that's very encouraging it because encouraging. he knows— and he tells us to, you know, confidently approach the throne of grace yeah, because yeah. of his work and, and, and ask for and receive the forgiveness of our sins. Yeah. And I yeah. think, I think, you know, there's the once for all sort of justification, the yeah. declaration that happens, but then there's, there's the polluting effects of sin in life. So he knows yeah. you're going to continue to come to the throne of grace to have your feet washed. Yeah. I mean, that's the Christian life, yeah. right? And, and. And just like and grieve, grieving him, like do not grieve the spirit. Yeah, and it's like he's our father. Now you know you you can make him like you can make him angry, not in the well, in, the, in sons, the condemnation sense. Yeah, exactly. If but our in sons the, offend us yeah. or do something terrible, yeah. you know we love them. We're grieved, yeah. but they need to come make it right. Yeah, like What's that's, that? that's a simple knock deal. it off. Yeah, yeah knock exactly, it off. Like, exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, like if one of my kids, as they did recently, gave me attitude. Yeah, I love them, and I yeah. said, "Listen, you're not your gonna... children. I thought you yeah, were a they're, pastor. They're perfect. We, everybody, um, we just look at your family on Sundays, and we just think, yeah. I see said... nobody has that problem with my family. <laughs> <laughs> we're very, yeah. we're very yeah. much. Nobody will uh, will put us on a pedestal, so we have that advantage. Yeah, yeah. Forgive <laughs> me, Lena. But... I said to my child, I said, "Listen, I said it's wrong to talk to me that way." Yeah, and that was very disrespectful. Yeah. I love you, but you're not going to do that. Right. And they said, Dad, please forgive me. Yeah. Like, that's beautiful. Yeah, there you go. Like, arms, arms are out. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you <laughs> right, go. You know? yeah, yeah. That's the goal achieved, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, it's that humility. It's that contriteness that that helps to repair the relationship when sin gets involved. Yeah. When sin pollutes. So anyways, right. yeah. I, think, I think it's just good to re remind those who listen, like, the heart of what we're trying to do in ministry is John 8. You should know the truth. The truth shall set you free. You should be set free from and, and understand what Romans 8, 1 is saying to you or Romans 5, 1. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God or Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Like that, that is the heart of what we're communicating of the great benefit and work of Christ to cover you from all your sins. And so that on that day, you will stand having boldness to stand because of Christ. Mm. We want people to live in the joy of that. Yeah. The, the, the joy of forgiveness, right? And um, that's the liberating message of the Christian gospel that when people understand it and believe it, it indeed will set them free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming on today to uh, talk gospel and justification. Thanks for having me down, Chris. We're gonna it's good to be here. Go get lunch and maybe we'll come back and do another. Okay. <laughs>
Thanks, Adam. All right. 